Funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Corn Board. When we transform Nebraska corn into ethanol, it doesn't disappear from the food supply. It just takes a little detour. Ethanol is made from the starch. The rest of the corn becomes livestock feed to create meat and dairy products, corn oil, sweetener, and other food ingredients, and maybe a little carbon dioxide to make your soft drinks fizzy. Homegrown ethanol helps satisfy America's hunger for energy and the world's appetite for feed and food. Nebraska's Family Corn Farmers, sustaining innovation. Market Journal, television for agricultural business decisions, is a presentation of the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine, and major funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Corn Board. Welcome to this week's edition of Market Journal. I'm Jeff Wilkerson. We're reporting this week from Scotts Bluff, Nebraska and the Scotts Bluff National Monument. On this episode, Chad Hart talks about the condition of U.S. crops. Aaron Berger gives an update on range and pasture conditions. Dave Boxler discusses fly control on cattle. And Jeff Bradshaw describes scouting tips for western bean cutworm. Iowa State Extension economist Chad Hart is our corn and soybean market analyst this week. The USDA says at this point in the growing season, the U.S. corn crop has been in better condition only three times since 1995. In 2000, 2004, and 2014. In 2000, the eventual yield was then the second best on record. In 2004, the final yield set a new record. And in 2014, the subsequent harvest set new tops for both yield and production, which still stand. Widespread heat set into a large chunk of the major U.S. growing region this week, the aftermath of which could be reflected in the USDA's next progress report. Ratings held relatively steady over the previous seven days, as seen in Monday's most recent release. Chad joined us Thursday afternoon from Iowa, where 81 percent of corn and 80 percent of soybeans are rated good to excellent. We began by discussing the current status of crops across the country. Well, as you're looking at crop conditions that, you know, USDA released Monday, we're still looking at a crop that's actually looking better than last year's crop for both corn and soybeans. As we look across the heart of the corn belt, you know, going through Nebraska, Iowa, into Illinois, what you're seeing are crops that are 75 to 80 percent rated good to excellent for both corn and soybeans. So things are looking really good. When you look at the heart of the corn belt, we get a little weaker when we start to look at the fringes. But again, overall nationwide, crops look really good right now. Do you think we'll see a big shift after this heat wave moved through uh, over the past few days in a major portion of the growing region? Um, I don't really think so, and, and here are the reasons why. I think, yeah, we're getting this heat dome moving through, but it's actually a fairly quick moving you know, heat dome, two, three days worth of extreme heat, but we also have a lot of moisture to work with, and that's going to help the crops, if you will, hold off that heat, survive that, and continue to look pretty good out there. So as I'm looking at crop conditions right now, I expect next week's report to look an awful lot like this week's report. Well, the question then, was this the last hope for corn prices to move dramatically higher with a weather rally? Not necessarily. I would say the next one we're watching for is going to be one that won't necessarily show up as far as withering corn conditions, but it's watching how hot the grain fill period is, especially what I'm looking for here would be hot August nights. If we do get those hot nights, that tends to shorten the grain fill period start to cut down on the yields, and we could see another weather rally based upon that. And still a little bit, little bit of time if we would get something in soybeans? Uh, definitely there as well. It's August that really matters as far as the soybean crop is concerned. We're especially watching the moisture there in August to see how well those pods fill out. Overall, what do you expect for crop margins in 2016-17 compared to last year, 15-16? As we're looking right now, the problem is both 15-16 and, and the new crop, 16-17 crops, are looking at negative margins. In this case, the corn margin has definitely taken a hit over the past two, three weeks. Uh, where here in Iowa, I'm looking at estimates where we're down 100 to $150 per acre as I look at the corn margins. As I'm looking at soybeans, we're a lot closer to break even, but we're still on the negative side, down about 25 to 50 bucks an acre. 
those portions or those farmers, I guess, that are seeing the biggest hit, is there a commonality among them? Do they rent ground rather than own it? Is there something that sets them apart? Um, oftentimes you hit upon it. It's the idea that those that rent the vast majority of their land, those are the ones that are finding more financial stress out there. It's also the ones that have been more aggressive and growing over the past few years because typically you grew through renting more land. Yep, you're getting a little more financial stress there. Let's talk about demand for corn. First in ethanol, how is it contributing to the demand picture? Ethanol demand has been really strong over the course of 2016. In fact, looking at this week's uh, petroleum report, we had the strongest ethanol production this past week than we've ever had. So record amount of corn demand, if you will, headed into ethanol, at least right now. And so that's been very strong. In fact, USDA has continued to ratchet that demand you know, strongly as we went through 2014, 15, and now as we look forward for the 16 crop. How uh, helpful have exports been? Exports have been pretty good counter seasonally. What we have seen this spring and early summer is stronger export demand than we usually have. Now this week's report was down a little bit. I would call it more like a normal report for this time of year. But as I look over the past two, three months, exports for both corn and soybeans have to help take prices higher early on and now are trying to help, if you will, hold prices from falling even further now. And as for the final bucket of corn demand, what about feed usage? Feed so far, it's been good but not great. The idea is that we know feed demand is building because we're looking at uh, increasing meat production. Whether I'm looking at the pigs, the cows, or the birds, we seem to be growing more of them. So it, we are seeing growth in that feed demand. But we're also going to see a lot of competition as we're looking at, again, strong corn crop, strong soybean crop. I'm watching the wheat crop, especially here, because especially if quality is an issue in the wheat markets, we could see more wheat going into the feed market. And how's the overall demand for soybeans? Overall demand for soybeans is, again, very good. In fact, looking at USDA's estimates right now, it'd be at record levels. Exports have been very strong, especially over the last six months. And our domestic crush has been really good because we're looking at, you know, creating that soybean meal for the livestock feed. But we've also seen some good demand growth on the soybean oil side as well, especially for industrial usage. To close out with Chad, what advice would you have for farmers that have stored grain left in the bin or are looking for opportunities to forward price? Well, let's start with that old crop first. If we've got it in the bin, what I'm worried about is that we need to clear those bins out right away because as I look at these crops right now, we're looking at very large production coming in this fall. We're going to need to store a lot of new crop, and so I want to get the old crop out of the way. So I am definitely looking to market that sooner rather than later. I'm especially worried about some basis erosion as we move from July into August because I do believe there's a fair amount of grain, especially corn, still lurking out there in, in farmers' bins that's going to need to move. Now, as I look at the new crop situation, I'm going to say, you know, given corn's decline over the past couple of weeks, I'm going to be willing to wait a little bit look and see if we can get another rally here going into harvest time based upon those hot August nights. With beans though, I would be a little more aggressive, maybe looking to market some new crop beans because especially if I can get those marketed in, maybe look into a basis contract as well to try to lock that in. The idea is that I think there are some opportunities to move some soybeans right now. Next week, Mike Briggs will join us to look at cattle markets. For more than a year, Nebraska has featured promising conditions in the weekly U.S. Drought Monitor. In fact, since June 23rd of 2015, the state has never placed more than 3% in moderate or D1 drought. But one of the drier areas has been north of here in the northwestern corner of the state. Scotts Bluff itself has received just more than an inch and a half of precipitation since June 1st, only 40% of normal for the time frame. On Tuesday afternoon, we spoke with Nebraska Extension's Aaron Berger, roughly 45 miles south of here in Kimball County, to learn about pasture and range conditions in western Nebraska. We started by asking about rainfall events for this area through late spring into summer. So in the western panhandle, April, May was pretty good for precip, especially in the southern half of the panhandle. You get in northern panhandle and northern counties, they got a little dry, especially toward mid to late May. As we moved into June, I still had some precip, became more spotty. 
in the panhandle. That northern panhandle is starting to show some effects of some dry conditions and feeling the stress. South panhandle really depends on where you're at, whether or not you caught a good shower or not. Still green in many places, but these warm conditions are starting to dry things out. In the areas that are stressed and with heat setting in this week, at least in this part of the state, what does that do to the quality of pastures and ranges? Yeah, so in many parts of the panhandle especially, we're gonna have adequate forage from a quantity standpoint. What's happening now though, is we're starting to see those grasses mature. And so quality is starting to be on the decrease. So that presents some challenges for us, especially for those who are later calving, moving into uh, breeding season in late June or late July and early August, especially on young cows and replacement heifers, may wanna think about some strategic supplementation, say two weeks prior to and through the first 30, 40 days of the breeding season. Uh, two pounds of a 30% type cube will provide some protein and energy to uh, maybe boost conception rates on especially those females that are still growing. This point in the season, what benefit does rain have? Yeah, so from a rain standpoint, we keep the warm season grasses still kind of green. In terms of growing lots of additional forage, we'll get some response from some of our short warm seasons like buffalo and blue grama. Our warm seasons, it's gonna have limited benefit from now on. Any rain we get from now through August, early September, really is gonna benefit those cool season grasses. It'll start to come back in that early September time frame. That's gonna be really the most benefit to us actually coming in the 2017 growing season. In the areas that could be kind of tough, what are the pros and cons of uh, early weaning? Yeah, so I think for guys who are maybe starting to get a little short on forage, uh, some pros of early weaning, obviously right now harvested forages or a grain is a pretty competitive option from an economic standpoint. Distillers grains, things like that can be bought pretty reasonably. And so we can put together a diet that's pretty competitive to feed that early weaned calf. The advantage to the cow is that we stop lactation, drastically reduce her nutrient requirements, and also we're just gonna reduce demand on pasture. So that's some advantages. You know, disadvantage is that we're gonna maybe need to bring those calves into an environment where it might be dry and dusty rather than have them out on pasture. Uh, we can work around that and do some things management wise, but it is gonna require you have some facilities and some things to get that done or work with a feed yard that can do it. We've talked about this before, but how efficient can dry lotting be? Dry lotting can be a really efficient tool in terms of managing a cow-calf pair or managing them separately. And especially when we look at feed costs right now, the value of corn, the value of hay, it's really a competitive option and one that we can uh, really work quite competitively under current market conditions. Are there any weed control issues that you've heard from producers around the area? So I think after the drought, and I realize it's been three years, but we're still seeing some impacts of the drought in terms of the plant community. A lot of native type annuals that have showed up, mare's tail, uh, spiny leaf thistles, some of those have been popping up, things like six week fescue, and sometimes concern by producers. So when we have native plants, I really caution folks around using any kind of herbicide control on those. I think it's really a cyclic type scenario where we have a lot of those in a couple years, they'll kind of go back and disappear again for the most part. So I think being cautious with that. From weed control standpoint, as we think about thistles, uh, a lot of those now are in a heading stage. Getting after those is a challenge at this point from a herbicide control. Our most effective control on these thistles, especially these noxious invasive ones, is actually gonna come this fall in the rosette stage in that mid-September on time period when they're actually starting to translocate and move nutrients back down in their root system to get ready for the next year. So from a control standpoint, that's the most optimum time to have an impact. To make sure I understand then, those, those weeds that you said could be cyclical, there's no need to control? You know, I really get uh, cautious about trying to control a native annual and plants that are here as part of the natural ecosystem. Now, any invasive type species, we want to be aggressive about those. But natives are part of the flux and natural ebb and flow of what we see come and go. And so I think it's recognizing that and uh, just realizing there are going to be a lot of those for a period. There will come a time when they'll be back to a more manageable level. I think it's fascinating that the drought is still having an impact out here. Is that normal? When would you maybe start to hope to finally heal from that 2012 impact? Yeah, so I think uh, when we talk about plant communities, it's they're very dynamic. They're not static, and so they change with moisture and precip and uh, spring temperatures. And those are all things that I think we really don't understand from a large ecosystem standpoint, how they ebb and flow and move and change. But obviously, yes, we have had more annuals show up, and that's just part of the natural ecosystem we have. On the Market Journal website, we'll link to more resources on some of the topics we covered with Aaron, including dry lotting cows as an alternative to grazing pastures. 
Three fly species in Nebraska can reduce weight gains in cattle, damage eye tissue, cause irritation, and cost producers a significant amount of money. Nebraska Extension's Dave Boxler says farmers and ranchers need to be aware of face flies, horn flies, and stable flies in Nebraska, especially during this point of summer. We talked with Dave Tuesday afternoon near the West Central Research and Extension Center in North Platte and began by talking about fly numbers so far in 2016. Well, we've had significant uh, horn fly populations uh, throughout the, this area of the, of the state. Also, very high stable fly populations in our pastured cattle. Why? Well, uh, it, it kind of goes along with all the moisture that we received earlier this spring and, and actually what we've been receiving uh, during the early part of the summer. Kind of unusual, but uh, the extra moisture allows the manure pats to stay um, with a little more moisture that allows the horn fly to complete its life cycle. Because it takes about 10 to 12 days to go from egg to adult. So traditionally when we see a very arid, hot, dry summer, you'll see lower horn fly populations this time of the year. But that's not what we're seeing right now. Why is that important? What kind of damage can they do? Well, horn flies can certainly impact uh, calf weaning weights anywhere from four to 15%. Uh, Nebraska studies show that anywhere from uh, 10 to 20 pounds can be lost at, at weaning time. So it's important to provide some means of fly control. There's a lot of different methodologies out there and you have to select the one that best fits your management style. Give me the signs to look for that uh, you might have a problem with horn flies. Well, if you go out, uh, say, between 8 and 10 in the morning when it's reasonably cool, if you see the horn fly uh, numbers, which are a smaller fly, about 3 16ths of an inch in size. If you see patches that are larger than the diameter of a three inch circle, you have a population that exceeds the economic injury level of 200 flies per, per animal. So that's something you wanna watch for. You don't wanna go out in the middle of the day and, and look at your populations because during that time period, the flies will be under the belly and you won't be able to get a very accurate assessment. What are the signs that you might have problems with other flies? Well, certainly with stable flies, if you see your cattle bunched in the corners of pastures, stomping uh, their legs, that is a, an excellent sign that you have a stable fly issue. And uh, our studies have shown where as few as about three and a half flies per leg will inflict uh, damage levels of or losses of 0.44 pounds per day in gain. So highly significantly impacting fly. Face flies? Face flies, we've seen a few out in this area of the state, again because of the high moisture that we receive. Traditionally, we'll see higher populations in eastern Nebraska where it's uh, a little more moist, but here we've seen some activity. I've actually seen some pink eye damage to some calves here most recently, cattle especially grazing along the river areas. In fact, I have got one client that we're working with that has a, a couple of issues with some of his, uh, his calves. How late into the summer or into the fall will these problems go? Well, certainly the horn flies will be with us probably well through mid-September, depending upon when we get our first frost. If we um, start losing our precipitation and continue to warm up, the stable fly numbers will kind of uh, decline a little bit. And they have in the last two weeks because we've been warm. Most recently received a, uh, an ample uh, amount of moisture, which may enhance their population once again. Reiterate to me what temperature does to those flies. Well, temperature, certainly the warmer it is, uh, it dries conditions out. The manure pat for the horn fly, the decaying organic material for the stable fly. Without moisture, the flies cannot complete development. We'll link to more information on fly control and pastured cattle on the Market Journal homepage. The July Nebraska farmer says there aren't many people in Nebraska who can claim to be professional loggers. However, this month's magazine says Herb Fricky and his family have been logging the Pine Ridge for 26 years. It started when fire struck his father-in-law's ranch in 1990 as Herb tried to salvage the burned logs. You can read about some of Fricky's logging jobs, including the reconstruction of a 4,500 square foot replica of the 1874 Calvary Barracks in the July Nebraska Farmer. Nebraska's corn crop is 55% silking according to the USDA's latest progress report. That's seven points ahead of the state's five-year average, but a point behind the nation's mark of 56%. 
to learn about western beam cutworm control in corn and dry beans, particularly in this part of the state. We talked with Nebraska Extension's Jeff Bradshaw in Scotts Bluff Wednesday afternoon. So the western bean cutworm is a moth. Uh, we usually start seeing it emerge in higher numbers around now. Uh, it's a pest of corn and dry beans, and the reason it's a pest is the adult moth will lay eggs in the corn or dry beans, and when the larvae hatch, uh, in corn, they'll, they'll graze a little bit on the leaves, but that's not really as important as when they drop down to the ear and they start feeding on kernels. And in dry beans, they'll feed on the leaves, uh, but then they'll also feed on the pods and the seeds inside those pods. And that, again, is the really important part of the, the damaging life cycle of that insect. Tell me about uh, your research that you're doing and kind of what you're trying to aim for this time of year. So uh, right now with Western Bean Cutworm uh, research we have going on is we're looking at this tiny wasp called a parasitoid. The scientific name is Trichogramma austrinii. Mm -hmm. There will be a quiz later. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and um, so it's, it's a very tiny wasp, uh, and it's interesting uh, in that it lays its eggs inside the egg of the Western bean cutworm. So right now we are doing some releases in the field at a couple uh, on-farm sites to s try to understand the efficacy, like how many of these parasitoids would we, need to be, would we need to release in order for them to be efficacious against Western bean cutworms. What uh, should farmers look for in their fields to see if there are signs of damage from western bean cutworm? So in dry beans, they're particularly difficult to scout. Uh, particularly, we have a number of dry beans that, that vine over and they just can't really uh, reasonably walk through. It's very difficult to find egg masses. In corn, it's a little easier to scout. Uh, the egg masses are generally find, found high up on the plant. And we have a threshold of about 4% of the plants uh, of 20 plants in a field on average uh, will give approximately a threshold uh, or action threshold for, for control. So typically we use egg masses or maybe small larvae uh, in that threshold. Uh, there's a number of um, foliar insecticides that can be used uh, to reduce their numbers, uh, but also some BT products. Yeah, tell me about the variety selection, how that might help. Yeah, so we have some different trans, uh, genetic engineered crops that we, we have um, uh, tools available to us for Western Bean Cutworm Control. A couple different gene events that uh, we can use that are expressed in the corn plant uh, in the ears that will um, reduce the survival of those Western Bean Cutworms. And so with our parasitoids, what we're trying to work with is to find another source of mortality for that insect, hopefully a, a, an effective and affordable way to manage them. Uh, because we've found in some situations, some areas in Nebraska might be seeing either reduced efficacy or possible resistance developing by this insect. Tell me about the resistance issue with this insect. So uh, myself and Julie Peterson in North Platte and Bob Wright in Lincoln um, have a number of different studies going on uh, looking at different, different aspects of resistance in, uh, with the western bean cutworm against uh, pesticides. Uh, one of which she's looking at is uh, resistance against pyrethroids, and the other is with a couple different events uh, that are expressed in corn, uh, BT events. And right now, it's, uh, we see a lot of variability between um, different fields in terms of susceptibility of those uh, corn traits against western bean cutworm. Uh, but she's got some uh, laboratory studies going on right now in North Platte to try to evaluate some of those uh, resistance characteristics. I should ask, what are overall numbers like this year? So. Um, uh, myself and Julie and Bob, we, we have a survey that we conduct every year, black light trap, um, and we collect numbers. And, and out here, anyway, uh, our black light trap has been the highest that we've seen uh, in the five years that I've been uh, scouting for these in this area. Uh, of course, that can be somewhat uh, um, location specific. We have high numbers here at our black trap behind me. Um, we have low numbers further north, um, just kind of north of the valley here. So it can be somewhat variable, but overall I would say the numbers have been higher. Now with this week's weather forecast, here's Nebraska Extension Ag Climatologist Al Dutcher. Well folks, here we again for the weekly forecast. And as we talked about last week, of course the heat kid did move into the region in earnest came across the state on Wednesday and it has been holding pretty much status quo for the last three days. We have temperatures that have been easily up into the upper 90s, low 100s. In fact, we had a couple uh, readings in the Shattern area above 105 degrees with heat indices anywhere from 105 to about 115 was a common tendency. As we move through the later of the week, we've seen our deep point temperatures come down somewhat, so the heat indices are starting to drop a little bit. And there is some relief in sight as 
we go through the remainder of this forecast period. During this last week, of course, we had a couple episodes of thunderstorm activity. One was last Friday night through Saturday morning that hit north central, central Nebraska and west central Nebraska. Then, of course, Sunday night into Monday, we had some uh, same activity in west central, southwest Nebraska, and then a little bit in eastern Nebraska off and on. We've had these scattered thunderstorms around, but overall, some locations haven't received anything and other locations have been done very well if you could escape the white combine. Overall, as we go through this next seven day period, I think the thing we'll be paying attention to is as we see this cold front moving into the region, how much thunderstorm activity will generate from it and will we return back to the hot weather. So let's take a look at the upper air models. We'll see what we can expect as we go through this next seven days and I'll draw your attention once again to another trough moving across the northern plains. It is expected to start influencing our weather in earnest as we go through the next 24 hours. So there is in the panhandle a slight chance for some thunderstorm activity developing during the period heating hours of the day as a surface cold front starts to make its way southeastward through the state. And as we get into tomorrow, we'll start to see that that trough starts to flatten the ridge out somewhat. We do show that basically these blue areas here subsiding air, so really not seeing a lot of lift as we go into Sunday, but more importantly as we go into Monday, the lift starts to increase as we start to see the whites and the reds to our west as another major trough starts to move in, and that's going to pull some energy into the northern plains and start to impact Nebraska, particularly as we get into Tuesday. You can see this area right here in southeast to South Dakota basically showing a very good lift, and that should impact northern Nebraska and potentially build backwards to south central Nebraska. This might represent our best overall chances for widespread precipitation. Then we see some residual energy on Wednesday hanging back in the southwest part of the state and in central South Dakota. So once again, we'll see the continuing chance for thunderstorm activity and that trough starts to deepen in the Great Lakes. So it'll start to push some cooler air into our region and give us a real good relief for a couple of days before we start to see the heat rebuild. So with that northwest flow on Thursday, we're going to see another piece, a couple pieces of energy moving southeastward. So these may not be exactly where the precipitation falls, but what it is telling us is that there is an increasing chance for moisture across the state. And as we get into Friday, now we start to see the ridge rebuilding back in. So another warm area is starting to build in, but we have yet another trough to our west, northwest that may impact us as we get later into the weekend part of August. So as we look at the forecast for the six to 14 day forecast, or eight to 14 day forecast from next Thursday through the following Tuesday, looks like that cold air starts to come in and we're going to to normal conditions in the northern plains. And we see an increase in precipitation. More importantly, the, the latest forecast for the month of August has come out and we see the same tendency with the trough developing across the northern plains, keeping us close to normal temperatures. And in terms of precipitation, the first outlook says that we are going to see an area of above normal precipitation from the northern plains to the central plains. I would caution you that these broadcast models in terms of the precipitation have not exactly been uh, fruitful in terms of their accuracy and the temperatures haven't been much farther behind. So take it with a grain of salt. This is likely to change as we get toward the end of the month. Thanks, Al. Today's interviews are available individually on the Market Journal website and through the Market Journal mobile app. They include information on corn and soybean markets, range and pasture conditions, fly control on cattle, and western bean cutworm. As always, you can keep up with Market Journal during the week by following us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Next week, Mike Briggs will analyze cattle markets, and Brent Gloy will discuss the health of the agricultural economy. Until then, thanks for watching. I'm Jeff Wilkerson. We'll see you next week. Join Market Journal online at marketjournal.unl.edu. You can also follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine, and major funding for Market Journal is provided by the Nebraska Corn Board. Market Journal is produced by the University of Nebraska Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources.